What's up team, this is Frank and do you enjoy the color beige? How about brown or tan? This is a quick and dirty review of Homeworld Deserts of Karak. In a scenario reminiscent of our homeworld, this planet is dying as the desert grows with each passing year. But luckily a relic has been uncovered by the ebb and flow of sand in the region and you believe that it holds the secret to saving everyone. So your coalition army from the north is launching a second expedition to the center of the desert since the first one ended so badly. The only problem is that the Galsine, who live in the desert, are bent on being as inhospitable as possible. The Galsine are much more maneuverable than your coalition army with their fancy hovering tech and all, but they are also less armored to balance things out. You won't get to play the Galsine in the story mode, but you can select them in skirmish and multiplayer games where you will notice some differences and many similarities with the other faction. For starters, Deserts of Karak is a real-time strategy game, but it shies away from the base building and defending common to the genre. Both races have a carrier that produces units, acts as a resource drop-off point, conducts research to improve armies and abilities, and can even join the battle as a formidable mobile fortress. You can shift power on your carrier to your weapons range, firepower, repairs, drives, and armor, which adds an interesting level of micromanagement and versatility. Since the game ends if you lose this thing, you'll often leave it at a danger when you're exploring the map. This won't leave your carrier out of the fight though, it can also launch cruise missiles and aircrafts for strategic long range strikes. Okay, this is something I love to do in these homeworld games, zoom in and check out all the moving parts. Every time I explain this to someone who doesn't know homeworld, they don't get it, I hope you do. Okay, back to the factions, both have light, medium and large units. The game tries to make units both strong and vulnerable in a rock paper scissors kind of way, but making a varied and powerful monster army and steamrolling your opponent will do just fine in the campaign. Sometimes when you try to zoom in on a unit, things can get very disorienting, as when the terrain gets in the way and causes the camera to flip out. Zooming out gives you a better overview of the action, and this is how you'll spend most of your time as you issue orders. You also have access to a tactical view, which shows you the entire map and allows you to move armies strategically. It can be accessed by conveniently tapping spacebar, or by clicking on this little map toggle here. Which I never do, except when I'm in the middle of a battle and definitely don't want to press the button. But this is the experience you're going to get with this game. It's intricate, gorgeous, and strategic, but it has some finicky UI and design choices. Since I already touched on how intricate it is when I talked about zooming in, let's talk about how it's gorgeous. The game's storytelling is really epic. Although the main antagonists are the most soft-spoken people on the planet, the storytelling really holds a lot of weight and gravity. There's one part in the game where your carrier has to reach an ally who's in trouble, but this thing moves like a hulking beast that's mired in molasses, so in the subsequent cutscene, the Capizzi flies into view, literally, which at first I thought was a bug. As it turns out, the carrier was running in the red for the past few hours, hightailing it to save you, and now she's red hot and damaged. And this carries into the mission as your flagship will start in such an overheated state that you won't even be able to shunt power to any of your systems. Also, the rest of your army couldn't keep pace with the Capizzi and so they show up a little bit later. And this really matters because in this game your units and resources are persistent by default, which helps with the sense that you truly are in the desert, miles away from home and making do with what's around you. It adds to the immersion and helps with the storytelling as it seamlessly drifts between the two. But there are times where you'll be snapped out of this immersion as when you try to queue up research like in every other RTS I've ever played. So, since I can't cue my research, you're telling me that I just have to remember to pick a new research option in 20 seconds? Also, I find resourcing in the game tedious at times. In the previous Homeworld games, there was the super handy and in my opinion essential auto harvest button, which you clicked to have your idle harvesters find the nearest resource points. In this game, however, you have to click on your tiny harvester and then click on this minuscule resource point, but sometimes things get in the way. So then, is it strategic? Yes, knowing when to use your carrier, when to take the high ground to improve your unit's efficiency in battle, when to use smoke screens and sand dunes to break the enemy's line of sight, when to use Rachel Sajet, your chief science officer, to EMP or capture enemy units, it's all these things that you need to manage that makes Deserts of Karak an interesting and strategic game. Okay, so I just mentioned line of sight, and it's actually a pretty important mechanic in the game. Like, perching my railguns on top of a sand dune and my siege units just behind it makes these units maximally effective. Or waiting under the crest of a dune for the enemy to show up so that I can spring my attack brought me a lot of satisfaction in this game. But sometimes you're snapped out of this flow, like when you're approaching a resource point expecting a small resource operation but instead a giant carrier materializes once you get within scanner range. I mean, where were you hiding buddy, behind the wreckage? Also, sometimes your units take a stroll someplace you never intended. The only time I raged in this game was when I lost my stolen honor guard who was at max XP because it went off chasing a retreating enemy. I know why this happened, it's because of the move attack command. You see, when you click A and then click on a location, your army will move to that location and engage any hostiles they encounter. This is important because you won't want to move your army through enemy lines with the regular move command. No, you want to attack move so that you can at least stop and shoot back. But unfortunately since larger units in this game are so damn slow and insist on parking themselves 3 kilometers away from the front line, they will often get distracted chasing some unit who showed up at their flank and promptly retreated like a minnow that swam up to a shark parade. 
Also, if I attack move, my support units here will walk right up to the front lines if they have nothing better to do, like heal units along the way. Then you have to micro them back before they get sniped by railguns that rip through metal like a hot knife through butter. The game's AI will often have these brain farts, which require you to be vigilant of your army like a shepherd protecting sheep from the Galcene wolves. Also, speaking of brain farts, the developers decided to put two of the four available factions in multiplayer and skirmish behind a DLC paywall. This made me immediately not want to play online. I hate when online games give pain players access to something that others can't have. It's one thing to let me grind for the thing that you're selling while other people pay for it to get it right away, but this is just too much for me. I still enjoyed playing a few skirmish games to see the two factions, but I wish I had the opportunity to play all four factions given the cost of the base game. Single player features a tutorial and 13 levels which took me just under 9 hours to complete on normal, and despite my griping, I enjoyed my time playing the story and as soon as I completed the normal campaign, I started up and completed a hard one as well. And that's it, that's everything you need to know about Homeworld Deserts of Karak. In the end, the frustration surrounding the research and resource management and the questionable DLC offers weren't enough to make me regret buying the game, especially since I I got it on sale. If you're a fan of the original Homeworlds, then this game will feel very familiar and enjoyable to you. If you've never played a Homeworld game but love the RTS genre, you should consider this game as the storytelling and battles really do feel epic at times. But if you hate slow moving units and can't look past any of the gripes I mentioned before, then you might as well pass. And if you've already played it, let me know in the comments what you thought of the game. And remember, this was a quick and dirty review of Homeworld Deserts of Karak.